The title of my sermon is, Did the Mission Fail? Did the Mission Fail? The first mission of the the twelve apostles, we find it in Matthew and Mark and Luke. It's recorded with slight differences between them. But Jesus sends out his twelve on a mission. The first mission. I've read about this event many, many times. I've been a Christian for around 45 years. I've read this countless times. But I need to admit that this first mission of the apostles, the sending out of the 12, to me, it's always seemed like a bit of a dud. More like Jesus was giving them like a practice round before the big game. Kind of kind of like a dress rehearsal before the main event. Matthew when we read this Matthew doesn't even tell us afterwards how it went. There, there's no record of how many were saved during the preaching. There's no record of how many demons they cast out or people they healed. We have almost no response whatsoever except that the the apostles in Luke and Mark come back and tell Jesus how it went. They give him a report. We don't know what the report was. It always struck me like a bit of a, well, a bit like lighting a match. Have you ever tried to light a match in the wind? You light a match and it goes out. You light a match and it goes out. Have you ever tried lighting a fire with wet wood? And instead of having nice, dry newspaper, you've got that glossy magazine stuff that doesn't really catch and burn and produce any heat. And the kindling's damp, and the fire goes out. This has seemed to me like that, like the fire went out. Did the first mission of the apostles fail? Well, I'd like to consider this this morning, and... We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 23, as we just read. It's a passage that's part of a larger section of instructions Jesus gave to the 12 apostles as he sent them out on their first mission. Look at the, uh, what follows this immediately, right after this, chapter 11, verse 1. Just look at chapter 11, verse 1. We see there, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on there, from there to preach, uh, teach and preach in their cities. So that's the end of the instructions, chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 5 is where it begins. Jesus here, it says in chapter 10, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them. Everything between there and chapter 11, verse 1 is the instructions. We're going to just look at part of the instructions today. Chapter, uh, verses 5 through 23. These are the apostles' marching orders, and we're looking at the first part of the marching orders. The mission Jesus gives them, along with instructions and warnings. In this first part of these instructions, we find here three facts about this mission that shaped the future of Christianity. And those facts are these. There, it talks about the, the men Jesus sent. It talks about the task Jesus gave them. And it talks about the danger Jesus foresaw. And again... These are not instructions for missionaries today. This is instructions given to the twelve. But as we think about whether or not this first mission was a dud, I think we're going to find some applications for us today. We're going to find, I think, uh, that this was not a dud. It was successful beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Well, anyone except Jesus. I want to give you another picture. Remember the pine cone I talked about last Sunday? Anyone, your memory go back that far? The pine cone? BC, British Columbia, one of the things I love about this province is it's full of lodgepole pines all over the province, in almost every part of the, part of the province. If those trees, lodgepole pines, if they are left to just grow to maturity... And of course, they produce pine cones. And if they grow to maturity and nothing happens, if they're perfectly safe and left alone, within a very short time, 
all the lodgepole pines in the province would go extinct. We'd be out of lodgepoles. If they're left in safety, left alone to grow to maturity, they'd be gone. All of them. Unless there is a forest fire. Because every now and then, forest fires come along, and what happens to the pine cones of the lodgepole pine? The waxy coating on the outside of the pine cone is burnt away and destroyed in the fire. And after the fire, that pine cone is made dry, and so it spreads, its, it releases its seeds, and it spreads its seeds, and lodgepoles multiply. They need forest fires to reproduce. Only then do the seeds scatter and the forests multiply with lodgepoles. That's why BC is beautiful. Was the first mission of the apostles a dud? Let's see. Look with me at verse 5. Let's talk about the men Jesus sent. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them. These 12, these 12, which 12? We looked at that last week, right? Mark 6 verse 7 says, Jesus called the 12 to him and sent them out two by two. In Matthew chapter 10 verses 2 to 4, Matthew just gives us their names two by two. And so we know they went out two by two just because he names them two by two. Peter and Andrew, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, James and Thaddeus, Simon and Judas, Judas, Judas. What do we say about Judas? Matthew adds, Judas who betrayed him. Because Matthew wrote this, you see, around 20 years later, maybe 25 years later. And the Christians at that time, everybody knew what Judas had done. Everybody knew what Judas had done. I mean, you don't really have the story of Christianity without the part that Judas played. Everybody knew what Judas had done, betraying Jesus and being the means by which Jesus ended up dying on a Roman cross. This was written for Christians a couple of decades after Jesus gave these instructions to the apostles. And so Matthew adds Judas who betrayed him. Because this is teaching Christians a generation later where their Christianity came from. How it all got started. Who leads the church? The apostles. How did the apostles get their job? How did they get appointed as apostles? Matthew's telling them this in this chapter. Again, it's like the DNA of the pine cone, of the pine tree, is already contained in the seeds. Like your Christianity today, if you're a Christian was already contained in the seeds when it began back then. So every Christian, 20 or 30 years later, knew what had happened to Judas, and they knew who their apostles were. But after Jesus ascended and rose to heaven, and the apostles and the rest of the disciples went back to Jerusalem and, and gathered there in the room that they were staying in, there were only 11 apostles. Judas was gone. So with God's guidance, they, they chose a replacement. And this is what Peter said as they were about to seek God to help them choose a replacement. Peter said, one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. That's Acts 1, verse 21 and 22. And Matthias was chosen to take Judas's place to become another apostle, to become one of the twelve. And that's why there are no more apostles today. Nobody else qualifies according to what Peter said there. Nobody else went in and among, or was with Jesus when he went in and among from, from us from the baptism of John until the resurrection and saw the Lord alive. There, are, there is nobody alive today who meets that test. So there are no more apostles today. Well, Jesus himself added Paul later on. As Paul says, it's a marvel that he did. He considers himself one untimely born and after the fact and the last of all. But these 12 plus Paul shaped the future of Christianity. These 12 that Jesus sent out. So you need to think about this, I think, if you call yourself a Christian. 
If you don't get your beliefs from those 12, plus Paul, why do you think you're a Christian? If you don't get your ideas, your truths that you hang on to from the scriptures that these 12 gave us, you, you have no right to call your beliefs Christian. It's like I said last week, if you're a tree, if you see a tree with maple leaves, one thing you know for sure is it wasn't born from a pine tree, wasn't born from a pine cone. You can call yourself whatever kind of tree you like, you can identify as a maple tree, it does not make you a maple tree. If you identify as a Christian, but your beliefs and values and truths you hold on to and confess don't come from the apostles, it does not make you a Christian, no matter what you say. So if you in any way want to disregard their testimony, you need to understand what Matthew says in Matthew 10, verse 2. He gave them authority. Verse 1, he gave them authority. It's Jesus' authority. And if you disregard them, you disregard Jesus. And if you disregard Jesus, whatever you call yourself, you simply are not a Christian. Okay, that's our first Christianity-shaping fact. The second is this. It's the task Jesus gave them. The task Jesus gave. Well, they were in Galilee, right? That's where this happened. Jesus gave them their task as they were standing on soil in Galilee. And Jesus tells them next where not to go first and then where to go second. Look with me at verses 5 and 6. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is really interesting. (laughs) And, And it's the theme, if you notice, if you look down to verse 23, it's the theme Jesus returns to in verse 23. He tells them what towns not to go in in verse 5 and sends them only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to the Jews. Then in verse 23, he's back to that point saying they're going to run out of time before they run out of towns. They've got a lot of work to do. And they will not complete the work before the Son of Man comes. They won't finish going through all the towns of Israel. It sounds like the job will be left unfinished. Well, it sounds that way. So was their first mission a dud? Was their mission a failure? The apostles' mission to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, it was not their mission. It was Jesus' mission. I want you to notice that's what Jesus says later in Matthew 15, 24. Maybe you want to write that down or look there. Jesus says, this is my mission, to go to the lost sheep of Israel. That's why Jesus was sent, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says that about himself. Then you look at verse 7 and 8. Jesus says, and proclaim as you go. Which is another way of saying, preach it as you go. Saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, the message is also Jesus' own message. This is not exactly, this is not only exactly what Matthew told us that John the Baptist had preached when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew 3 verse 2. It's also exactly what Jesus preached, the same gospel Jesus preached in Matthew 4 verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus sends the disciples on his mission to the lost sheep of Israel with his message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Mark and Luke both add that they did call people to repent. So it's exactly the same preaching. Jesus sends the twelve to go to the same people he was sent to on the same mission he had to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he gives them the same gospel to preach. His gospel, his message, his mission, his people. And what is it? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right there. It's so near. 
It's arrived, it just hasn't quite come through the door yet. Jesus also tells him to do the same miracles he did. Healing the sick, Matthew says, raising the dead, cleansing leprosy, casting out demons. That's simply all the things that Jesus has been doing in Matthew from chapter 7 through chapter 9. In the same, it's the same list. Matthew's very precise here. Which means that Jesus is making it crystal clear to the 12 apostles that he is sending. That their mission is nothing more and nothing less than an extension of his. His mission. So if we wonder and if we doubt whether the first mission of the apostles failed, we need to understand what we are asking is, did Jesus fail? The stakes are high. We're not just talking about their mission. We're talking about his mission. He's the one sending them. It's his authority going with them. It's his power that's accompanying them. It's even, we're going to find out, his words that are filling their mouths. By his spirit, the spirit of his own father. Did Jesus fail? Was his strategy to send the twelve into Galilee... Was it a dud? Was the wood just too wet and the kindling too dry to to catch fire? I don't think so. Consider the message he gave them to preach, verse 7. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. They went around Galilee preaching it. Well, how do I know they went around Galilee preaching it? Jesus said, don't go into any Gentile territory in verse 5. Another way to translate that is, don't take any roads that lead to the Gentiles. Then he says, don't even enter the towns of the Samaritans. Well, they're in Galilee. And if you look on a map in the back of your Bible, all the roads that go from Galilee to anywhere either go through Gentile territory or right through Samaria. Jesus is saying, in other words, stay in Galilee. That's the only way to obey his instructions in verse 5 and 6. And he's saying, preach to these people, the kingdom of heaven has come close. It's so near. It's right at hand. Preach to them the message you've heard from John the Baptist, you've heard from me, and now go and preach it to others, Jesus is saying. News. It's about news. Gospel news. News of God's kingdom that it had come. Good news that although Israel was like a household of sheep, that had forgotten who they belonged to. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They'd forgotten who their master was. This is good news that although Israel was like sheep who belonged to a shepherd that they'd run away from, this was good news that that shepherd is now inviting them to repent and come back. It was good news. And it was the same gospel John preached and Jesus preached that people needed to hear to get ready before the kingdom arrives. Charles Spurgeon said their first work was proclaiming the coming kingdom and preparing the way for the coming king. I think that's right. It was a harvest Jesus was sending them to gather. Remember the words of chapter 9 and verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. People sometimes say, well, what does that mean? What's the harvest? And who are the laborers we're supposed to pray for? And Matthew would say, duh, keep reading. Look at verse 10, look at chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus calls his 12 apostles and sends them with a message 
for the people of Galilee, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Just keep reading. It's right there. That's the harvest. They're supposed to go and gather it. But the harvest comes from preaching the gospel, and the gospel is news of grace. Jesus tells them in verse 8. Look at verse 8. He says in the middle of the verse, You received without paying, give without pay. They were never to charge money for it. Ever. Never, ever charge money for their, mis- for their message. Never, ever charge money for the miracles, for the healings. Oh, demons, 100 bucks today, special deal. Just never, never. How often? Never. Never. Not for preaching the gospel, not for healing the sick, not for raising the dead, not for cleansing lepers, not for casting out demons. It was all to be free, just like God's grace. God's grace to them was free. The ministry, the way they ministered on, in Jesus' name had to be consistent with the message they preached. They worked for Jesus, which means they worked for God, and God pays their wages. God pays their wages. So to help them learn this, and also, also I think it's important that the, the apostles here, including Matthew here, is writing to teach Christians something 20 or 30 years later. To understand why the apostles' message cannot be changed or altered or f- adjusted to fit the preferences of the people that are hearing the message, later Christians. Jesus now hammers home the point that they work for God. They're being sent on a journey. And as they're being sent on a journey to cover approximately 100 square miles of Galilean territory, Jesus says, don't charge money for what you do. Don't even pack for the journey. Look at verse 9. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts. The idea is don't go fundraising or don't go gathering money now to put in your belts for when you're going to need it on the journey. That's the point. Don't get any bag now for your journey or two tunics, like an extra tunic or sandals or an extra staff. Why? Here it is in verse 10. For the laborer deserves his food. For the laborer deserves his food. It doesn't mean go barefoot. It means don't pack extras. Travel light. Travel fast. Why? Verse 10. For the laborer deserves his food. Jesus had just told them to pray earnestly at the end of chapter 9. Pray urgently at the end of chapter 9. To the Lord of the harvest. And now Jesus is saying, if you are working for the Lord of the harvest, if you are working for God, God will feed you. In other words, let there be no confusion about who you work for. The one who pays the bills gives the orders. Isn't that right? Can you imagine? (laughs) If Jesus had not laid this down from the beginning, if this did not shape the future of Christianity, can you imagine if churches later on did not conform to this principle? What would you have? You'd have people telling preachers what to preach. Wouldn't you? Absolutely. The people who pay the bills give the orders, don't they? Paul says no. 1 Timothy 5.17 even seems to quote Jesus when he says the laborer deserves his wages. And no, says Jesus. The apostles work for God. And so too, 20 years or 30 years later, and 2,000 years later, church elders work for God. If God blesses you with what he's given you by the church elders, by the pastors who preach, if he's blessed you through that ministry, well then bless them with what God's given you. The laborer deserves his wages. From the very first mission of the apostles, the mission was Jesus' own mission. 
the message, whose message was it? It was Jesus' own message. The miracles and the authority behind them was Jesus' own authority. The same miracles he did. And the messenger. Who does the messenger belong to? Jesus. This is all a work of Jesus. So if you consider yourself a Christian, ask yourself whether you submit to Jesus or whether you resist him. Whether you submit to his apostles or whether you resist them. Whether you submit to the elders today who preach his word, the word of the apostles, or whether you resist them. Now, look at a word in, that shows up in verse 11. It's a word that shows up about four times here. And it is four times. It's not about four times. There's a word here that shows up exactly four times in five verses. First, the laborer or the worker. It says he, des- he deserves or is worthy of his food. Verse 10. Second, that's in verse 10. Second, in the towns or villages they go to, find out who is worthy there and minister among them in verse 11. Who is worthy? Same word as deserves in verse 10. Third, when they enter a house, if it is worthy, give it peace. If not, well, don't give it peace. That's at verse 13. Look with me at verses 14 and 15. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. What makes an apostle worthy? What what laborer deserves his food? What makes an apostle worthy of their wages is whether they obey the master. It's whether they obey Jesus. What makes the hearers in every house or village or town that they go to, what makes the hearers worthy is whether they obey the master, whether they obey Jesus who sent his apostles. That's the message, isn't it? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And do you know what a kingdom has? A king. And do you know who's coming? The king is coming. Get ready. You're not ready. People, get ready. Repent. That's the message. And who is worthy? It's the one who repents and makes himself ready and gets ready to receive his king, to own his king, to worship his king. So do you bow down before the king and do you submit with gladness to the authority of his king through the apostles, through their scriptures, and through the elders who preach it today? Or do you join the rebellion and rise up against him? Are you one of those people that makes the apostles shake the dust off their feet as they leave those towns and villages of Galilee? Are you one of those people that shake your feet, the dust off your feet as you leave the church because you don't like what the preachers preach, they're too biblical? Well, most of you are sitting here so far, so I'm encouraged by that fact. Every Jewish kid knew about the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, even though that was about 1,900 years before, almost as long as it's been since Jesus said these words. (laughs) The preaching of, or the sending out of the apostles is kind of halfway between the, the catastrophe of Sodom and Gomorrah and today. The fiery destruction of those cities was legendary, wasn't it? They were immoral cities. If you think their destruction is somehow unfair, God is too harsh. Well, you need to understand that they were immoral cities full of the worst kinds of human trafficking, full of the worst kinds of abuse of women and children and everybody. Nobody would approve. Not Maybe the vilest of people today would approve of what went on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said he would spare those cities if even a handful of righteous people were left in them. But nobody was found but Lot, Abraham's nephew. 
So the question is, as Jesus is sending out his apostles, is would the villages and towns of Galilee be any different from Sodom and Gomorrah? How many worthy people would be found in them? How many will repent and receive Jesus as their king? And I think you need to let that sink in. You need, you need to pause there and let that thought sink in for a second. The apostles were authorized, as Jesus says it, to give peace or to withhold peace. To give every soul who receives the gospel and submits to Jesus an affirmation, a verification, a word promising peace now. For every sinner who receives grace. That's why I end the service often as I do. After preaching the gospel, if you've believed the gospel, if you've received the gospel, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, then I can say at the end of the service, I can say with all the authority of the Holy Spirit behind the words, go in peace. Not because of me, but because you believe the gospel. If you trust in Jesus today, you can go in peace. You're at peace with God. You, the world might be a storm around you, a whirlwind of chaos but you are at peace if you believe in Jesus today. So the apostles were given the authority to give or withhold peace. If you resist Jesus, if you ignore the message of salvation, you have no peace with God. So we've seen the men Jesus sent. We've seen the the message that he gave them, the task the area of ministry, the miracles to perform so that people would be ready when the kingdom arrives. They would believe the message because of what they see the apostles doing. We've seen that these men Jesus sent shaped the future of Christianity in some ways already. That the message that he gave them is still our message today. It's the same message. But notice something else here before we move to the third point. Look how it all glorifies Jesus. The apostles, they went out as his messengers, representing him to the people of Galilee, glorifying Jesus as king. The apostles preached his gospel, his salvation, glorifying, lifting up Jesus as the goal and the good news of hope and salvation for everyone who repents and believes. The apostles also now glorify him in in the way Jesus foresaw that they would suffer on his account for the sake of his name. And when we read about the lives of the apostles, when we read about their faithfulness, we still see Jesus glorified through them. So the third point I have for you this morning is the danger that Jesus foresaw. Now, I suggested earlier that when we come to verse 23, Jesus has come full circle now to how his instructions began in verse 5, right? Did you see that? Talking about what towns not to go to, just go to the towns of the lost sheep of Israel, of the house of Israel. And now, in verse 23, we see he comes back to that. He says, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel Before the Son of Man comes. Another way to translate that is you could not go through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. It's an impossibility. It's based in a condition here, but it's suggesting it's not going to happen. Jesus is not so much, I think he is making a prediction, but it's not just a prediction, it's also an assessment. Talking about the towns of Israel, he was sending the apostles to reach with the gospel. Let's ask that question, did Jesus fail? Was their first mission a dud? Was the wood too wet? I'd like to suggest that the way to picture this first sending of the twelve is that Jesus scattered pine cones across the region of Galilee, preparing for when the forest fire would come. Something like that. 
And when it did, the ministry of the twelve exploded into a harvest of thousands. I'd like to ex- suggest this, but I think the scriptures tell us this. Look with me at verse 16. Jesus says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. I love the animal metaphors there. Three kinds of animals in one verse. Four. There's four. Wolves, sheep, serpents, and doves. It's like a zoo. Jesus' point is that this is a dangerous situation. Not because it's a zoo. That's not what I meant. But the danger here doesn't only describe the first original mission Jesus gave the the apostles. It describes their situation as long as they remain his apostles. It's a job hazard. The word sending here in verse 16 is literally the word apostello, where we get apostle from. Jesus says, if you could see the danger you'll always be in as long as you're my apostles... It would be like you'd be a bunch of sheep and you'd look around and you'd you'd see you're always surrounded by wolves. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. You need to be able to see that. I love it that this prepares the church also to understand our situation today. But again, that's an application. He's not talking to us. He's talking to the twelve. Why is it so dangerous? Because Jesus is saying, if you're carrying my message... Because of your my apostles, my emissaries, my messengers, heralds heralding the arrival of my kingdom, those people hate me. All of them hate me. And Jesus says they're going to hate you. It's not about you, 12. It's about me. Look at it in verses 17 and 18. Beware of men. I thought I should have made a plaque of that and put it on my daughter's door, your bedroom door. That means mankind, people. Beware of people. People are as safe for the apostles as wolves are for sheep. It's still true today for elders and preachers of the word. People are the problem. People are the danger. It's because the apostles work for God It's because they work for God that they won't shut up when people tell them to shut up. It's because the apostles work for God, they won't change the message to suit the preferences of the hearer. And Jesus warned the apostles, they will be delivered, they will be flogged, they will be dragged away, he says, for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. And you will be dragged before governors and kings, For my sake, for my sake, he says. To bear witness before them and the Gentiles, the nations. The hostile reaction they get, it will land them in jail, it will get them beaten, but it will move beyond the synagogues to the courts of the kings, to the courts of the nations. It will succeed in getting the message out to an international audience. The pine cone only opens under the forest fire. But notice how Jesus here foresees where they get into trouble. First the synagogues, like throughout Galilee perhaps. And then before governors and kings and Gentiles or nations, it's persecution that releases the seed. It multiplies the apostles' witness. And notice what forms of trouble Jesus foresees in verse 17 first. Delivering to councils and flogged in synagogues in verse 21, delivered over to death. That's about as bad as it gets. Betrayed even by family members. Jesus uses a verse from the prophet Micah to paint a picture for how his message will drive a wedge between family members. Because nobody likes this message until the Holy Spirit changes your heart. No doubt it it started as soon as the apostles took Jesus' message all over Galilee. Can you imagine the family divisions? But none of them were put to death at that time. Even though Jesus is talking to them here. They were later on put to death and so he's preparing them. After Jesus had been raised and gone up to heaven, James was killed by King Herod. 
Paul was arrested and flogged and dragged before governors and kings and ultimately before the Roman emperor himself. All of these things did happen just like Jesus foresaw, but he's preparing them here. Jesus tells them, beware of men. That's good advice for preachers who preach the apostles' message still today. Beware. Remember, you don't work for men, Jesus is saying. You work for God. Look with me at verse 19. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. It's Jesus' mission. It's Jesus' message. They're Jesus' men. It will be Jesus' words. The Spirit of your Father will speak through you. Jesus tells them, when they deliver you over, don't be anxious how you are to answer, what you are to say. It's the same word anxious that Jesus says back in chapter 6 when he says, don't be anxious about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat. Don't be anxious. Why? Don't you know your heavenly Father feeds you? He's your Father. Don't you know your heavenly Father clothes you? He's your Father. So how much more If the Father will take care of His children, how much more will the Father protect His messengers? When they deliver you over, don't be anxious what you're to speak or what you're to say. Why? Because the Spirit of your Father will give you His words. The one who stays faithful, Jesus says, to the King, the one who endures to the end, will be saved. The one who remains true to the message cannot be killed by earthly kings since he works for a heavenly emperor. So they're willing to suffer, willing to be mistreated, willing to be reviled, slandered, to face prison and death because of what they know, because of who they serve. They know it's worth it to spread the news about Jesus' kingdom. That it's worth it to burn hot for Jesus and to die For his sake, for his name, and for his glory. It's worth it. Nothing else is worth it like that. The apostles shaped the future of Christianity by how they lived and they died for Jesus. They shaped our Christianity. Do you see that? This is what we believe. It's still worth it. To go out in a blaze of glory for Jesus, even if your life is like that, and it matters to no one here on earth to serve him truly until the day of your death. It's worth it. They relied on him, they obeyed him, and he spoke through them, literally. The Spirit of God the Father, the message of God the Son, the testimony they delivered in Galilee and in Jerusalem and throughout the Roman Empire. We have it in the book of Acts. The scriptures they gave us to preserve and to pass down the testimony God gave them. The word of God still speaks through those apostles to this day, doesn't it? So at that first mission, Jesus told the twelve only to go to the lost sheep of Israel. But after his resurrection, everything changed. He told them, go and make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, 19. Now it was global. But first they preached that message in Israel. Did their ministry fail? Did that first mission fail? It did not fail. The message didn't. The mission didn't. The messengers did not fail. Their preaching did not fail. Their Messiah did not fail. Their king could not fail. Before two months had passed, after Jesus was raised, Acts 2.41 says, Peter preached and 3,000 were saved in one day. In Acts 2.47, it says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Just imagine, you start from 12 and 3,000, and then day by day there's more. In the first year of the apostles' mission to take the gospel to all nations, Acts 4 verse 4 says, The apostles were preaching and 5,000 Jewish men, this time it's men, were saved, not counting women and children. There were already over, way over, 
10,000 new Christians who had believed the gospel, who had believed this message. And the church wasn't even a year old yet. It could barely walk. Look with me at verse 23. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. I would like to suggest that when the apostles preached in Galilee, they planted pine cones everywhere. When Jesus was raised, he appeared to those who had come from Galilee to Jerusalem, to people who became his witnesses, according to Acts 13.31. When they preached Jesus to the Jews in Jerusalem, they had 10,000 pine cones in one day. Well, no, sorry, by the end of one year. And when the hostility and persecution Jesus foresaw here broke out like a forest fire, so Christians fled in every direction to Samaria, Acts 8, verse 1, and then throughout Judea to the ends of the Roman Empire. The persecution released the message around the world. Like 10,000 pine cones suddenly hot and dry and bursting open with seed. Spreading that message faster and farther than anyone could have possibly ever imagined. But Jesus foresaw it. In Matthew 10 verse 5, Jesus tells the apostles to preach for now only in Galilee, only to Israel. But that was only the first mission. The seeds were planted. The witnesses multiplied. And at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives new instructions for the global mission of his apostles. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask this day your blessing upon us, your people that we would be people of the word, that the ministry you entrusted to your apostles would be the ministry we carry forward today. We don't have their authority, but we have the authority you gave to them. We have the words you gave to them. Lord, we ask for faithfulness. We ask that you would give us your Holy Spirit so that we too would endure to the end, that we too would stand fast, that we would not abandon you, that your word would continue to bear life and bear fruit in us, and Lord, that our witness would multiply. And so we ask, Father, that as we go out from here today after lunch, as we go forth, that even this week, the words that you give us to speak, as we bear testimony to what the testimony of the apostles was, your message, that Lord, that you would reap a harvest still this week. We ask that tonight as Nathan preaches at our evening service that the words of truth, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would still ring with power and bear fruit. We ask, Father, that there'd be a multiplication of gospel witness from Beacon Church, not only in individual lives, but in churches planted. We ask, Father, that the day would come when we would say, oh, that was just the beginning. You don't know how it ended. Father, would you do so much more than we can ask or imagine, as you promise you will. Father, would you lift up and glorify Jesus Christ as King in this place, as our Lord and Savior, as the one who is worthy of dying for and living for. And we ask this in his name. Amen.